Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. This accidentally turned out to be kind of a well-timed episode just in terms of what inspired it and what's been going on with that inspiration. Um, The show Succession just won a kajillion awards. Yeah. (laughs) We originally tried to record this episode the day after that happened. Well, that was the day after one of the awards shows. Yes. There have been several. They have really been sweeping and, in my opinion, well-deserved. I can talk more about succession on behind the scenes. But uh, this is not a spoiler, but in season four, there is a moment where one of the characters, Logan Roy, is observing one of his low-level employees. And the employee is understandably nervous because this is not normal for this person who runs the company to be walking the floor and he is very uh carefully typing out some stuff and the logan roy character says you've typed one email and he uh calls him a staccanovite and i'm like ah why didn't why haven't we ever talked about the staccanovites um because this is a really interesting strange uh orchestrated moment in labor history in the ussr And it, you know, kind of exemplifies some problems and propaganda that were going on. So we are going to talk about Alexei Stakhanov and his achievement and how that was parlayed into a a big moment for Stalin uh, and for his plans. Yeah. So to set the stage of Alexei Stakhanov's achievements and rise to fame, we have to talk about Stalin's five-year plans. In 1928, Stalin rolled out a policy to overhaul the economics of the Soviet Union. His regime's assessment was that the Soviet Union had become too entwined with capitalism. There needed to be a plan to break that. So the five-year plan cycle was announced, and this name's pretty self-explanatory in terms of the structure. Every five years would focus on a set of goals that was intended to achieve what Stalin envisioned was a more perfect Soviet Union. We talked about some of this in our episode on the Holodomor famine. So just to recap, the first five-year plan included programs to expand industry, generate more energy, and collectivize agriculture. And that may sound kind of benign, but it was not. The collectivization of agriculture point was particularly brutal. The Kulaks were a class of farmer in the Soviet Union and Russia before it who were considered, it's often called wealthy peasants, meaning that they operated well above a subsistence farming level. Kulaks owned their own land and usually livestock, and they had the means to employ other people on those farms and enough land holdings to lease some out. Kulaks became cornerstones in a lot of communities because they also conducted financial and administrative support in their villages. Sometimes they would even issue mortgages. And to Stalin's government, this was capitalist and inherently wrong. So part of the first five-year plan was eliminating the Kulaks. Prior to the introduction of the five-year plan, Stalin's regime had already tried to make life harder for the Kulaks. They did that through things like heavy taxation and new laws that restricted their land usage. But starting in 1929 as part of the first five-year plan, what has come to be known as de-Kulakization began, with a call to, quote, liquidate the Kulaks as a class. This included violent attacks on Kulak farms, as well as deportation, arrest, and property seizure by the government. And all of this was done under that goal of collectivizing agriculture. Literally, they wanted to put all farmers to work under one collective umbrella for the government, rather than any of them working for themselves. This was all framed in propaganda as necessary to achieve non-capitalist industrialization. But one of the direct results of this was a massive famine. That was the Holodomor. As we mentioned in our episode on the Holodomor, the loss of farming expertise that came from this dekulekization, plus bad weather and poorly run state farms, all meant that the grain industry collapsed. We talked in that episode how a lot of this was like in what's now Ukraine, because Growing grain was such an enormous part of the Ukrainian economy. As the country started to recover in 1933, after having experienced millions of deaths, 
The Soviet government tried to cover things up, and time was ripe for some sort of story that could be used to bolster morale and boast to the globe of Soviet superiority. As this disastrous first five-year plan came to an end in 1932, being claimed as a success in spite of all the serious problems it had created, heavy industry became the main focus for the second five-year plan. This is where a man named Alexei Stakhanov became famous. So Alexei Grigorovich Stakhanov was born on January 3rd, 1906, in the town of Lugovia, which was in the administrative division municipality known as Levensky Uyezd, which in turn was part of the Oryol governorate. Less than a decade before he was born, the Levensky Uyezd census tallied a population of just under 300,000 people. In his early 20s, Alexei met a woman named Yevdokia, who was possibly Roma, and the two of them started a romantic relationship. They never formally got married, but they lived as husband and wife, and they had two children, Claudia and Victor, together. Stakhanov became a coal miner, working in the state-run Central Ermino Mine in the Donbass region in what was, at the time, the Soviet Ukraine. The entire coal mining industry had been reorganized from the top down in 1933 when the leadership within the system was assessed as being inefficient and unable to meet the goals that had been set by the Communist Party in the five-year plan. New targets were set for all mines as part of this reorg, Donbass was considered a poorly performing mine area. It rarely met the production goals that had been set for it. And the work there was unsurprisingly grueling. So the system for this mining was set up as sort of an every-man-for-himself affair, with financial incentives to produce the most coal. But that meant that each miner was picking at the tunnels on his own, lying down, propping up the tunnel himself with logs cut to various lengths for that purpose. And then once enough coal had been picked out, he loaded it onto a cart. And then he would hitch that cart to a pony and walk the pony out of the mine for drop-off of the product and then back in. And according to the official story, Alexei Stakhanov thought this was a really foolish way to run a mine. He had a plan to reset the workflow with four-man teams. So one man did the picking, one man did the needed bracing as the coal tunnels were picked out, one loaded the coal, and then one managed the ponies and walking them back and forth. But he also thought it would be better to upgrade from a pick to a drill, so he trained to use one. According to the official story, Stakhanov approached the mine's leadership with this plan, and initially their reception was lukewarm. But he persisted, and he got the local party leader involved. The idea was that there would be a test shift using this method to see if it was worthwhile. If it failed, Stakhanov would be the one that would take the heat. Initially, Stakhanov was not the one intended to actually be the miner on this test shift, the Communist Party leaders wanted somebody to do it who was a member of the party, and he was not. Of course, they also wanted that person to be strong and skilled. There just weren't any other candidates who were as well-suited to it as Stakhanov himself was. On August 31st, 1935, Alexei Stakhanov went into the mine for a six-hour shift. The local Communist Party leader and a journalist were on site to report what happened, and when it was over, he had mined a mind-boggling 102 tons of coal. That is not a typo. It is reportedly 14 times the amount that he would normally produce in a shift, all purportedly because of his new method of dividing the labor in the mines. So if you're thinking division of labor wasn't really a new concept in 1935, you're right. It wasn't new globally. The assembly line, popularized by Henry Ford, for example, had been in operation since 1913. It wasn't new to the Soviet Union either, and this form of mining had been championed in Soviet mines on and off since the 1920s, but had never really gained wide support. Additionally, this situation was set up where it was a test, so Stakhanov was the only miner working in the area during the test. This was a situation where he physically didn't have to move far from one mining ledge to another. He wasn't sharing space with other miners, not having to keep out of each other's way, things like that. We will loop back to a discussion about the real nature of that historic night in a little bit. 
publicly, this was a banner PR moment for the Communist Party. At last, the idea of a super-efficient Soviet Union had a touchstone, and an every man who could be modeled as a hero. His achievement was first written about in the papers of Donbass, and soon caught the attention of Sergo Orzanikidze, who was the Minister of Industry. He, in turn, according to the official story, brought this story of Stakhanov to Stalin, and Stakhanov quickly went from local hero to national star. He was also given an instant membership in the Communist Party. Pravda wrote about Alexei, and the Communist press started touting the benefits of the Stakhanov system. Alexei Stakhanov, who was the sudden darling of Stalin's government, was moved to a nice, furnished apartment and given a horse and a buggy. This was a luxurious upgrade from the life he had been living. Later, his daughter Violetta shared with the BBC, quote, Dad was particularly proud of the horse. A tour was also planned, part lecture tour and part training tour, so Alexei could share his knowledge with the rest of the country. Coming up, we will talk about additional ways that Alexei Stakhanov's life changed, but first we will pause for a sponsor break. As Stakhanov's fame grew, his partner Yevdokia grew increasingly more uncomfortable with the situation. She eventually left, and her exit from his life is described sometimes as running away with a group of Romney travelers, possibly running away with another man. The two children stayed with Alexei, but Alexei had women writing him letters all the time, so he probably did not take Yevdokia's exit too hard. He could not, however, read those letters. He openly told journalists that he didn't know how to read or write and that party leaders read his letters for him. While he was touring the country, Alexei was honored with a performance by a school choir in the town of Kharkov. And in the choir was a girl named Galina Bondarenko, who Alexei was immediately interested in. She was only 14. And modern versions of this story say that he fell instantly in love with her That is obviously romanticizing a very unbalanced power dynamic between an adult and a child. He wanted to marry her, and he did, very quickly. Her family was poor and likely thought this match would secure a good future for her. After the marriage ceremony, it seems like they lived mostly apart for two years, though, while she finished school. Accounts are pretty fuzzy on this detail. Translations are ambiguous in the language that they use to talk about it. Their daughter, Violetta, described this relationship as one where Galina respected Alexei like an elder more than having loving feelings toward him. He was described by family as possessive and jealous with his wife, although this couple did seem to develop something of a real partnership over the years. Yeah, it's really weird. That age gap thing is talked about in very cagey language where it's not clear if they were really living as a married couple for a couple years at all or not. And I think that is purposely cagey because nobody wants to discuss how yucky it is. Uh, Alexei continued to travel the country while Galina returned to life as a student. His fame had been instant and the so-called Stakhanovite movement had begun. But while many were cheering him as an example of a hero worker, there were other people who did not share that enthusiasm. He later claimed that he had been attacked on the street by workers who didn't appreciate him promoting the idea that everyone should be exceeding their work goals by a factor of 10. Anti-Stakhanovites, Stalin would later say, met with violence and loss of jobs for their attitude. In the years immediately following the fervor of Stakhanovism, the movement's detractors were branded as saboteurs. Some were punished for this with hard labor. On November 17, 1935, after several months of campaigning for the adoption of Stakhanov's intense work ethic for the benefit of the country, Stalin spoke at the first conference of the Stakhanov movement gathered in Moscow. It was a rousing speech that appealed to the assembled attendees as being the most progressive and advanced members of the workforce as evidence of the superiority of a socialist society. Quote, It has already been said here that the Stakhanov movement, as an expression of new and higher technical standards, is a model of that high productivity of labor which only socialism can give and which capitalism cannot give. That is absolutely true. 
There were other points made in Stalin's speech, including the importance of Stakhanovism for the next step of the Soviet government. He said, quote, its significance lies also in the fact that it is preparing the conditions for the transition from socialism to communism. And when Stalin described the workers who had embraced Stakhanovism, those words painted them as follows, quote, they are mostly young or middle-aged working men and women, people with cultural and technical knowledge who show examples of precision and accuracy in work, who are able to appreciate the time factor in work and who have learned to count not only the minutes, but also the seconds. The majority of them have taken the technical minimum courses and are continuing their technical education. They are free of the conservatism and stagnation of certain engineers, technicians, and business executives. They are marching boldly forward, smashing the antiquated technical standards and creating new and higher standards. They are introducing amendments into the designed capacities and economic plans drawn up by the leaders of our industry. They often supplement and correct what the engineers and technicians have to say. They often teach them and impel them forward, for they are people who have completely mastered the technique of their job and who are able to squeeze out of technique the maximum that can be squeezed out of it. But the part of Stalin's speech that's most quoted and most written about was the propagandist way he painted Stakhanovism as something that organically grew out of the bedrock that the Soviet government had laid. Quote, What first of all strikes the eye is the fact that this movement began somehow of itself almost spontaneously from below, without any pressure whatsoever from the administrators of our enterprises. More than that, this movement in a way arose and began to develop in spite of the administrators of our enterprises, even in opposition to them. The basis for the Stakhanov movement was first and foremost the radical improvement in the material welfare of the workers, Life has improved, comrades. Life has become more joyous. And when life is joyous, work goes well. Hence the high rates of output. Hence the heroes and heroines of labor. That primarily is the root of the Stakhanov movement. Aside from being propaganda, this was all a flat-out lie. The country had just been through a famine, a series of purges at Stalin's order as well, This was not a time of joy or prosperity for most of the population, far from it. And the Stakhanovite movement, as we'll discuss in just a moment, was really orchestrated. At the conclusion of this speech, Stalin said, quote, finally, two words about how it would be fitting to mark this conference. We here in the Presidium have conferred and have decided that this conference between the leaders of the government and the leaders of the Stakhanov movement must be marked in some way. Well, we have come to the decision that 100 or 120 of you will have to be recommended for the highest distinction. The implication here, of course, was that Alexei Stakhanov himself would, of course, receive such a distinction. But he would wait a really long time for it. On December 16th, 1935, Time magazine ran a cover story titled Heroes of Labor. To be clear, this was not a piece praising the Stakhanovite movement. It opens by mentioning a number of new words that the world had learned thanks to Stalin and describing some of Stalin's horrific moves, including the eradication of the kulaks. Then it pivoted to Stakhanovism, stating, quote, the great new addition to vocabularies, Stakhanovism. Today, a fresh battle has opened over Stakhanovism and thus far enraged workers have done most of the shooting in coal mines, factories, railways, and even on the dictator's favorite collective farms in recent weeks, desperate Russian workers have slain Stakhanovites. Pride and sabotage. Six months ago, the most violent of dictator Stalin's henchmen, big-nosed, hot-eyed commissar for heavy industry Grigory Orzanagidzi, demanded that Russian workmen pitch in and really learn to use the machine tools their government was buying from the capitalistic world at drastic sacrifices of food and other Russian goods. The Time article frames the Stakhanov story as one in which the Communist Party had found a good story and flag bearer in the minor, quipping, quote, one Alexei Stakhanov, a skilled pneumatic drill operator in the Donbass coal trust sector, was discovered by the Soviet press this year to be performing prodigies soon was raised by Bolshevik puffs to the status of a hero of labor. 
This write-up goes on to mention that there's a contradiction in this whole campaign since communist leaders had been criticizing capitalism for its constant efforts to speed up production. It also points out that while a handful of workers like Stakhanov were being given lavish gifts by the government for what they had done, those outside that small group wondered what would happen if more workers did start to produce at such extreme levels. There was surely no way everyone could get the same incentives and be given new apartments and carts and more. Alexei was moved to Moscow in 1937, where he was given an executive position in the coal ministry in a luxury apartment, as well as cars and other amenities. For a man like Stakhanov, who had grown up poor and found himself suddenly surrounded by the party elite, it was a big adjustment. The way of life in Moscow, working in political circles, was challenging. He was introduced to someone at a party by Stalin as a future government minister, and according to family accounts, he was terrified. Galina, who had also grown up poor but had a much better education than her husband, is described as the person who helped him through this adjustment by having more savvy regarding the commingling of social and professional aspects of their new lives. Alexei and Galina had two daughters while they were living in Moscow. Violetta was born in 1940 and Alla in 1943. They also had two other children who died in infancy. Alexei and Galina's daughter, Violetta, told the BBC a terrifying story about an experience that Galina had while they were living in Moscow. To set the stage, we have to talk for a moment about Lavrenti Beria, who was a terrifying figure in Stalinist Russia. Beria joined the Communist Party in 1917 and was eventually assigned to intelligence, leading to his appointment as head of the Georgian secret police. His rise through the party ranks continued, and in 1938, he became head of the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, and also part of Stalin's inner circle. He was a callous and violent man, known for casually ordering mass executions. He became known by the nickname the Kremlin Monster, and he was a serial sexual predator who raped an unknown number of women. One of his predatory activities has been described as something of an open secret in the Communist Party. He would have his driver take him around Moscow at night, and when he saw a woman or girl that he thought was attractive, he'd stop the car. They would pick her up, usually by invitation. Sometimes he would send his staff out to search for prey, and then they would be taken back to bury his home. Some left at the end of the night, but the discovery of remains of numerous women on the site later during a construction project indicates that a lot of them did not survive their time with him. Yeah, his whole story is so upsetting, and there are so many horrifying details. But um, to circle back to Alexei Stakhanov's wife, Galina, and how this all ties to her... One day, as she was out shopping, a car that had been slowly following her pulled up next to her and asked her to get in, and she did. Lavrenti Beria was not in the car, but she was driven to his home. Galena in this story is clearly a very cool-headed woman, because when she was brought into the house and kind of realized the danger she was in, she told the officer there that she was married to Alexei Stakhanov and that she was pregnant. And that put an end to things. After that, she was escorted back out to the car and she was taken home. But Alexei was angry with Galena for having gotten into the car because Beria's practice of looking for victims was so well known. It seems like she thought, this is somebody in the government who knows my husband and they need me for something. Um, but despite this incident, the Stakhanov stayed in Moscow and Alexei continued to work for the coal mining industry into the 1950s. Well, Stakhanov didn't stay in Moscow forever, though, and we'll talk about what precipitated his move after we hear from the sponsors that support Stuff You Missed in History Class. On March 5th, 1953, Joseph Stalin had a stroke and died. And once the ensuing power struggle over his successor was complete, which included the arrest, trial, and execution of Lavrenti Beria for treason, Nikita Khrushchev was the new premier of the Soviet Union. And Khrushchev made a point to shift the Communist Party and the government away from the structure that it had become under Stalin. During a closed session of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party held in February 1956, Khrushchev gave what was called his secret speech about the problems of the Stalin government and the reforms that were needed. In it, he noted, 
And I will say we are quoting an English translation that was released. So this may have been uh, heavily edited for... <laughs> for uh, um, uh, English-speaking audiences, but this is what we have. In it, he noted, quote, At present, we are concerned with a question which has immense importance for the party now and for the future, with how the cult of the person of Stalin has been gradually growing, the cult which became at certain specific stages the source of a whole series of exceedingly serious and grave perversions of party principles, of party democracy, of revolutionary legality. Under Khrushchev, there were, as promised, big changes, which got the nickname de-Stalinization. A lot of Stalin's programs and decisions were overturned or eliminated, and eventually those reforms impacted Alexei Stakhanov. It was determined that there was no reason to keep him in Moscow, and in 1957, he was given orders to go back to where it had all started, which was Donbass. He was made chief manager of the mine at Torres, which was definitely a step down from the cushy job he'd had in the capital, although he continued to give talks to students and consult with other mines. He had been in Moscow for 20 years at that point, and to be shuttled 1,100 kilometers away felt to him like he was being discarded. Stakhanovism as a movement had been lauded and credited for achieving goals within Stalin's five-year plan, and then it just kind of sputtered out. Stakhanov's family stayed in Moscow so Violetta and Alla could finish school there. Feeling isolated and as though he had been exiled by the Khrushchev government, Alexei began drinking heavily. He was often asked to come to Moscow by his family to visit, but he pretty frequently declined. Despite the fall-off in enthusiasm for Stakhanovism after its initial surge and its relegation to history once Stalin was gone, Stakhanov continued to be a heroic figure throughout the time of the Soviet Union. In 1970, he finally received the accolade that he thought he had been promised in Stalin's speech in November of 1935. He was given the honorific Hero of Socialist Labor. His drinking became so problematic that he got into trouble at various times. He is alleged to have been in a brawl at the restaurant in the Metropole Hotel that resulted and the loss of his accolade and of his Communist Party card. In November of 1977, in Donbass, Alexei Stakhanov had a stroke, and he died shortly thereafter. 1978, the city of Kadyevka was renamed Stakhanov. This was a coal mining city in what is modern-day eastern Ukraine. Though his reputation may have tarnished, he did still hold an iconic status, particularly in the coal industry. In 2006, Takanov's pneumatic hammer was included in a display at the Kremlin Museum as part of an exhibit about gifts given to Soviet leaders in the 20th century. There are historians who break down the flaws and improbabilities in the entire Stakhanov achievement story, who say that that famous night when he produced such an enormous amount of coal was staged by the communist government. In a 1985 New York Times article discussing the 50th anniversary of Stakhanov's record shift, journalist Sergei Shmemin writes, quote, Konstantin G. Petrov, the chief of the Mines Party Organization, recalled that Stakhanov's wife strenuously resisted his attempt to make her husband a hero until she was silenced with the gift of a cow. Uh, that wife was his partner, Yevdokia, was not as actually married to him. This suggests that Stakhanov knew ahead of time that he would be successful and that this so-called test was mostly for publicity. Yeah, Yevdokia was like, I don't, I don't want everybody looking at our family. Um, this article also notes that the entire shift was meticulously planned and that Stakhanov had two men propping in his tunnel and that Petrov was also in the mine holding a light for him through most of the shift. There were also additional people on hand to expedite the entire process, not just a four-man crew, as was often reported. The article quotes an interview that Petrov gave in the early 1980s, saying, quote, I suppose Tikhanov need not have been the first. It could have been anybody else. In the final analysis, it was not the individual face worker who determined whether the attempt to break the record would succeed, but the new system of coal extraction. But Alexei was the first. Why then? Well, because before a record can be set, a man has to believe in its feasibility and in his own powers. We had been looking for just such a stalwart fellow. In 2015, Alexei's daughter Violetta gave an interview in which she talked about her father, their life, and his legacy. 
She simultaneously spoke very highly of her father and alluded to some of the less ideal aspects of the story, including her mother's very young age when Alexei chose her to be his wife. Stakhanov emerges from her interview as almost a cautionary tale, a man who was suddenly intensely famous because it served the people in power, and then, in losing it, couldn't handle the fall back out of favor. In 2021, an article in the periodical The Conversation points to Stakhanov as the harbinger of modern workplace culture of overachieving at the expense of employee well-being. And to be clear, there is absolutely a problem of workplace culture and management that can negatively impact employees and lead to both physical and mental burnout, at best. But that's a complex issue. You can't really lay it at the feet of one person or even attribute it to one moment or cause. It was not as though worker exploitation was invented with the Communist Party's handling of Alexei Stakhanov's story. The Industrial Revolution had already led to plenty of exploitation and abuse of workers, and even then, it wasn't new. Additionally, the adoption of the idea of a sort of super worker who routinely overperforms is a choice that a lot of companies have opted to adopt and use to goose performance output in the 20th and 21st centuries. So we can't really say it's this moment that caused this problem. And it's worth noting that even with the staging that's now recognized as having happened in that August 1935 test shift that made Alexei Stakhanov famous, it was still a pretty remarkable feat. The pneumatic drills at the time were just beasts that were hard to control and exhausting to handle, and Stakhanov did run it for six hours. So although his effort was exploited by Stalin, and though he didn't really come up with the whole idea of a division of labor, even if he had help, the accomplishment itself was still pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I... I feel so bad for him in all of this story because they clearly were like, we want an uneducated person that we can exploit who is also a very strong... Like, he ran a drill for six hours, which is a lot. And I think that's why his his status as kind of a hero in the coal mining industry in particular has sustained a little bit more, even though there are obviously problems with his life and some of his decisions. Right. Um, that's all. I just wanted to make that note at the end. So nobody goes, do you not know how hard it is to do? I'm like, I do know how hard physical labor is, and I don't want to take that away from him while we can also talk critically about the rest of it. Uh, But I have a really fun listener mail that made me smile and smile. It is from our listener, Ashley, who writes, Dear Tracy and Holly, longtime listener, first-time writer, I am an actuary. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> fully credentialed fellow of the Society of Actuaries, and January 8th was my birthday, so imagine my surprise when you accidentally gave me one of my best birthday presents ever. I really enjoyed both episodes and the behind the scenes. I laughed a bit when you talked about technological advancement. When I was a baby actuary about 20 years ago, I had forecast models that would take a week to run. Now, that same model would probably take an hour. So does our work go faster? Nope, not at all. We just make the models more complicated. I really appreciate your careful and considerate approach to sharing history. Thank you so much for all you do. I listen to the podcast a lot while running, and it certainly makes the miles go faster. I do not have pets, so no pet tax, but my family and I love to travel when we can. Attached is a photo of Sue the dinosaur from the Chicago Field Museum. Best wishes to you both for a wonderful 2024. Listen, I will always take a picture of Sue... The field is one of my favorite museums in the world. I know I've uh-huh. said it on this show before. I love it. Also, like, this is one of those emails that was a gift to me because anytime we talk about a profession, I'm always worried that people in that profession will be like, you ding dong, you know what you're talking about. Like, you can read all the books you want, but the reality may be very different. <laughs> so, really, Ashley, you gave me the gift. So I thank you. If you would like to email us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as missed in history. And if you have not subscribed yet, you can do that. We are easy to find on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.